uh, start our new passage. It's called Pyrus and Polites. You'll find it in your folder. Um, first, let me say how much I miss you guys, and I miss uh, seeing you face to face and be able to have the great amount of fun we've had so far this year. But, you know, such as it is, we'll get on. Real quickly, for Monday, your vocab is going to be this side here, left. On, I mean, on Tuesday. This will be your Tuesday vocab. And over here on the right side is going to be next Friday. Uh, we'll work on the passage. Today, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to work to find all the verbs in this passage. At the end of the day, you will go ahead... And if you look real closely, I am highlighting right now words that are verbs. And I'm looking closely, I think that would all be all of it. Now, this word eke is in fact an imperative of sorts, but we won't list it. It says we're going to use it as an interjection. See, look, or behold. Um, it's uh, clearly um, the way Virgil would be speaking to one person, like, hey, look at this. Um, and we'll come back to that when we're doing the translation. So one of the parts of your work today is you're going to do the verbs, but not right now. Um, don't be surprised that I didn't highlight this word here, vulnere. That is not a verb. Um, it's the ablative form of this word here, vulneris, vulnus vulneris. Um, <clears throat> on uh, Tuesday, you're going to have these words. Atrium, which is an atrium, or a great hall. Kaides, which is slaughter or murder. Conquito, to fall or to fall in a heap. Okay, behold, elabor, to slip or to escape. We get an elapse from it. Iwato, iwasis, we get evade, evasive, um, and clear that's one of the meanings. Fundo, to pour out. Hostas is a spear. Infestus is hostile or threatening. Look at the words for next Friday. Lustro, to traverse. Not to uh, born or a child. Os is a mouth. Uh, porticus is a portical or a a colonnade. I'll show that in a minute. Primo is the press. Salcius is, uh, is wicked. Tandem is at last. Waquus is empty. Wolneris is a wound, deadly or, or a deadly blow. So there's your vocab. Tuesday, Friday. The other thing then is, um, after you finish the verbs, or uh, you'll be done for today, but make sure you're studying this stuff over here for month, Tuesday. Um, today I'm going to draw some pictures for you and describe the story. On the blank note sheet that I'm going to give you, your next task is going to be to highlight the notes that I gave you. So what I'm going to talk about in a minute, you're going to note. Um, I'm going to do it orally with pictures. You're going to make notes. When you're done with that, you're going to submit it. And the third thing for today is going to be, you're going to do these verbs, move them down here, take a screenshot of them, or you could send it off in this format and submit it to me. Now, so um, I'll have that all set up for you. So let's talk about the story. I had you do a little reading today. We had this bad guy named Sinon. And Sinon's the guy who was left behind by the Greeks to deceive the Trojans. And in the reading you read today, he's begging the people. He says, listen, man, I, I was going to die. They were going to make me the human sacrifice, but I escaped. And King Priam, who turns out to be a pretty darn good guy, um, comes up and says, you know, I, uh, I believe your story. Come on into my kingdom. And so Priam, he basically says, we're going to go on and we're going to Accept this as the sacri a sacrifice to the gods. And he's going to allow the guy to go back up to the fortress or the citadel up at the top of the hill. That's going to play a key role in our story. What happens in the story after he tells Sinon he can go up? Well, 
Priam obviously has been duped. But our guy, the guy that we just read about, Lacoon, Lacoon is a bit horrified. And if you remember, he's that priest. I'll put something in a stupid hat on him. Um, and he's like, oh my God, no, don't do this. Um, but being a priest, he does what he's supposed to do. And that is, he's going to make a sacrifice. And when he goes to make the sacrifice, he has his children with him, his sons. What he's hoping is when he makes a sacrifice, some kind of omen will show the people that this is a mistake. And what happens is um, Minerva, uh, working um, supposedly on the side of the Trojans, the great goddess, um, seems to be deceived or th drawn into this. Because what happens is a god, the gods, do something terrible. There's a little stream or a river, and this is one of the ways they tried to find the real Troy, was to try to find a river or stream that went near the city. And as he's making a sacrifice, the text tells us that a giant serpent comes out of the water. And swallows up Laku and his sons. They all die. That temple then, or the snakes or the serpents that come out of the water, then slither up the hill and hide in the temple of Minerva. The people look at it and they don't think of it as a bad thing. They immediately go, oh my God, the gods are trying to tell us something. And what they think the gods were saying is that Lakun was full of it. And so they take it as an omen that Priam's right and Lakun was wrong. Well, what does that do? It allows the Trojan horse to go in, into the building. And you and I know what happens there. Once the Trojan horse gets into the hill, into the building, in the middle of the night, the horse is opened up and all sorts of evil happens. Soldiers pile out. There's not a lot of them. And, but how did they get out? they got out because Sinon was allowed into the building and Sinon was the guy who snuck over and opened up the trap door and all the soldiers came out. Now what was their real task? The real task was to come out but more importantly to open the gates that the horse had been in. In the next paragraphs, the story really just unfolds terribly. And literally, our man, Aeneas, only tells you the parts he sees. What's going on with Aeneas at the time? Well, he's doing what any good Trojan would have done that night. He's sitting in bed with his wife, and they're sleeping. Sound asleep. Soldiers pouring in now the now open gates of Troy. And slaughter is happening everywhere. The way the story seems to be shown is that there's this outer wall, and then within the city, there were higher terraces. 
and the highest terrace would have been the one where the palace and the citadel would have been. Somewhere in here is our man Aeneas, but we're not exactly sure. But he's sound asleep. Well, how does he wake up? Well, in one of the first great moments of vision, Hector, the ghost of Hector, comes to him. The ghost of Hector yells, you got to get up. And literally, the gods had sent Hector's ghost to him to, you've got to get up. But what he tells him is, you got to get out of Troy. And you got to found a new city. But our man Aeneas doesn't know what the heck he's supposed to really do. So he leaves his family, and he rushes out, and he gets into the battle. What happens when he gets in the battle? Well, at one point, he and all of his men are getting are running up and down streets and we hear these wonderful scenes like at one point he runs by and he sees Helen of Troy huddled in a corner of course she's huddled because she was uh, brought there by um, Paris and she's an outcast she's fearing for her life and there's a moment when he's like I should go kill her but it doesn't take his time to do it. He just can't. There's another moment where he and his men are running through the city and they realize they've got to, they're going to get slaughtered. So what do they do? They kill a bunch of Trojans and they rob the Trojan gear. Their helmets and their shields and they put them on. And they start to fight and at first when they find Trojans, they, they're slaughtering them. But then the problem comes is as they get closer to the citadel, as they're fighting their way this way, the Trojans up on the hill don't recognize them as Trojans. So their own men fire down on them and start killing them. Finally, they get to the main scene for our story. And our story is going to take place in the building that includes the palace a portico on the outside. And it must have been like the building where the king lived was attached on one end and the great temples would have been attached at the other end. You get the idea. And what we're getting to is Aeneas can only tell us what he sees. And he and his men fight their way down this portico. They go up a staircase and they get up on top here and they start to shoot down on the enemy below. And this brings us to our two warriors today. If you look at our passage, it's called Pyrrhus and Polites. Who's Pyrrhus? He's one of the great Greek heroes. Who's Polites? He's one of Priam's sons. So now we know of three sons. Paris, the guy who started the whole thing off. Hector, who is dead. And now, Polites. And of course, what's Polites doing in this storyline? He's trying to fight his way back to his dad and his mom. And in our story, he has tried to hold off Pyrus right out here. And they're fighting and fighting and fighting. And our, we're going to pick it up right there. Aeneas, of course, from up here, can see everything that happens. And he's going to describe it. And that's why he begins... Behold, and our story will begin with these two men rushing down this portico, through the doors, into the courtyard, and towards the doors 
that will lead to where the palace. Inside the palace, huddled away, will be the king, the queen, Supreme and his wife, and in the corner also his daughter, who is, as we know, her fate is pretty miserable in this story, Cassandra. We'll pick it up there. So, what do you do next? Summarize this, put it on notes, send it to me. Second thing, work on your verbs. Third thing, study this vocab for Tuesday, this for Friday. Guys, I can't tell you how much I miss you. Uh, take care, and we'll talk soon. Thanks.